Thank you. Well, it gives me a uh, great pleasure to welcome today Dr. Harshan Kumar Singham, Senior Lecturer in British Politics at the University of Edinburgh. I should say quickly, if you've not met me before, I'm Rob Fletcher, Professor of History and Kinder Professor of British History uh, at the Institute. Now, Harshan uh, received his doctorate in comparative politics at Victoria University of Wellington in New Zealand. And his work is really at the interface of history, politics and law. It's very much of the interdisciplinary kinds that we at the Kinder Institute are working to promote. So it's a great pleasure to have him here today. Harshan has held a number of positions before he came to Edinburgh, including as the Smuts Fellow in Commonwealth Studies at the University of Cambridge, uh, the Alexander von Humboldt Fellow at Ludwig, Ludwig Maximilian University in Munich, which is when I think I first met you, uh, Harshan. Um, he also, also held positions in London and Sydney. Harshan's work focuses on the political and constitutional history of Britain, its empire and the Commonwealth, uh, with publications ranging across the 20th century and right up to and including the crises of today. He's the author of a number of books and edited collections, including a 2013 book on power and the parliamentary system in post-colonial India and Sri Lanka, and most recently, he edited a collection on vice regalism, the crown as head of state in political crises in the post-war Commonwealth. Uh, and indeed, this is in part what he'll be talking, us, talking to us uh, about tonight. Uh, as always, we'll look forward to a good discussion uh, at the end of Harshan's talk. And do feel free to message me in the chat if you have any, any questions you'd like to ask. And of course, I'll ask again uh, at the end of Harshan's talk. Uh, but for now, it's over to you, Harshan, for your paper on vice regalism, constitutional crises, heads of state, and their history in Britain and the post-colonial world. Thank you so much, um, Rob, and thank you to the Kind Institute for um, hosting me today. It goes without saying that I would much prefer to be with you in person, but um, alas, such things are not possible. Um, if you just give me a minute, I will um, set up, um, I have a slide so you don't have to look at my uh, face all the time and to put you off. So instead you can look at a, some slides instead to take away from my face. But in some ways it's a, it seems a bit odd to talk to an American audience, or largely American audience, about um, constitutional crises involving heads of state. Um, but um, in, in, in some ways, that's why I'm very much looking forward to your questions. But interestingly, which may surprise you, uh, the issue of heads of state and constitutional crises are not ones that are normally found in um, contemporary British history or even um, post-imperial history in um, around about decolonization and the British Empire and Commonwealth. So that in some ways is the uh, was a starting point for um, this project, which is um, underscores the uh, talk I'm I'm giving you today. So now this this um, this little uh, these lines here confound their politics, frustrate their knavish tricks. On thee our hopes we fix. Now, these are lines, um, those of you, uh, I should add, by the way, I have no intention of talking about Harry or Megan uh, in my, in my uh, talk today. It's, it's uh, not, not, not popular monarchy I'm looking at uh, today, but, or rather unpopular, it seems, but uh, looking at it from a, a very different way. But these are the lines from um, God Save the Queen, the, the national anthem, not just of... Um, Britain, but of many parts of the Commonwealth, which still have the Queen as head of state. Now, these lines are not usually used in, uh, in, in, in pop, you know, not use it in festivals or, or festivities or cere ceremonies that much anymore. But nonetheless, the, this, this 18th century uh, song uh, in some ways captures some of the ideas that how the crown as head of state has a role in politics as well which again as you you might know very well in in um, the states but many in britain and um, even those who study britain and empire uh, 
uh, are in some ways ignorant of this political role rather than the ceremonial role of, of the monarch and the powers that come with it. <clears throat> so, in some ways, we often think of things like um, um, absolutism when we think of arbitrary power when it comes to um, monarchy, absolute powers of, of someone like uh, Charles I. But it said, or even when dictators use such things, but vice regalism is in some ways conceived to look at a parliamentary head of state rather than an executive one such as the American uh, presidency. So instead, so not looking at this as a, um, a parliamentary head of state uh, by its um, by its implication of that term, looks at whether they are in ruling or reigning in partnership with parliament as opposed to being a, a completely separate branch um, of the uh, legislature. Um, Vice regalism, in some ways, speaks to this idea of the crown having these reserved powers. These idea, this idea of having a one, a, a, having a role that is, in some ways, from a pre-democratic period when monarchs actually did have real executive power. But then, in the evolution of something like the British Constitution, these evolve evolved where there were conventions where the monarch no longer played an active role in politics. But interestingly, the law never changed. So these are governed by conventions, which are, as you know, more a guide, a tradition of how things should be done, sometimes an invented tradition, to use Hobsbawm's phrase, but they are nonetheless, but they're not a law. It's not, a, it's not fixed that a monarch or their representative must act in a certain way. But in some ways, um, thinking as I know that I have a, an American audience, I, 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 I thought of some of the impressions that um, someone like Alexander Hamilton had about what the crown has and does in the, uh, and what observed in the British constitution and how that would may potentially translate into your system. And Hamilton um, in, the, in the Federalist Papers saw that the, the, the sovereign, while having many formal powers, often saw greater utility in exercising the influence, in Hamilton's words, of drawing from a thousand sources over brute executive action. Uh, so this would mean that the, the monarch um, would hesitate, in his words, to exercise a veto, which the monarch still does have, against parliamentary opinion, but would not fail to exert the utmost resources of that influence to strangle a measure disagreeable to him to avoid being reduced to the dilemma of permitting it to take effect or of risking the displeasure of the nation. That Those were Hamilton's words. Hamilton's interpretation links to the importance of influence that comes with this ceremonial role. <clears throat> And this is something that was especially um, also taken with great effect by some the, the journalist, um, 19th century journalist, Walter Badgett, uh, who um, wrote just over 150 years ago his famous book, The English Constitution. Uh, and I will um, come back to him um, shortly. But it's interesting, so most in, in times of peace and times of uh, democratic or political tranquility if we take to the more modern period, the, usually the idea of the crown is not, and as a political player, a political actor, is not discussed almost at all. It's usually only in times of crisis when these things happen. Now, it would be very tempting of me, especially as someone in, in Britain, uh, to uh, talk about Brexit as being a big crisis of where all these things are happening and, where, and indeed there was a lot of discussion which is something I've written on as well about the crown taking a role in the Brexit uh, crisis but in some ways the major <clears throat> 20th 21st century uh, crisis where the crown was uh, potentially involved was in um, 
excuse me, the crisis around the idea of the House of Lords reject, potentially rejecting the budget of, uh, of Lloyd George and other measures of the Liberal um, government since there was a, the, the Tories were had, by, had a majority in the House of Lords. And there were many, including major constitutional scholars like A.V. Dicey and Sir William Anson, who believed that only, in, in, in Anson's words, only, our only safeguard against the disaster of revolution, which they thought was going to happen at the time, is to be found in the exercise of the prerogatives of the crown. I'm not ready to admit that under such circumstances, these prerogatives have been atrophied by disuse, but on the other hand, they can be exercised under certain conditions which those who write on the subject are, are apt uh, to ignore. And these were echoed also by Dicey, who, um, who said about these late, this latent royal power, who himself was quoting Edmund Burke, its repose may be the preservation of its existence, and its existence may be the means of saving the constitution itself on an occasion worthy of bringing it forth. So this, this uh, also, and, and during this particular crisis, there were, I mean, there were major, it was a major difficult time where there were literally ideas of where the leader of the opposition, Andrew Bonnelaw, was literally talking about having mutiny against uh, the king's rule and, uh, and, and the government in Ireland, which could have caused major uh, disruption, not just in um, Britain and Ireland, but across the wider empire. And, and, and he... He, he and and Bonner Law told the king that that time George V that whatever he did he would be damned by half his subjects and that is some of the um, interest of some of, the, of of this type of work I think. <clears throat> so if we then take so we look at this in some ways from a uh, British perspective. But these ide the ideas of the crown, of course, and for, especially for people like uh, Rob and I who study empire and decolonization, what happened with the crown was by no means a domestic, um, domestic sphere. It was a much wider global imperial and post-colonial sphere since the actions of the monarch um, in very various uh, different ways had very important manifestations uh, across other states um, as well. And this happened especially around this time where there's the export, if you like, of forms of responsible government, but also where there was a still, even though Britain had largely democratized by the early 20th century, most of the, much of the empire, even of these, the, the settler states, still had very strong powers and expectations of royal powers from the king or queen's uh, representative. I, I'm sorry, this is probably extremely difficult uh, for you all uh, to read, but this is, I'm just giving you, coming, bringing up to a more um, modern period to give you some idea, if we think of, um, Elizabeth II, so bringing it right up to the present, of who is, of course, we are know her mainly as uh, the Queen of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, but that uh, in some ways uh, very much disguises actually her manifest global and, um, and international constitutional and cultural role uh, that she has. So this chart has um, the number of prime ministers and governor generals where um, the Queen Elizabeth II is, is um, head of state. So um, she, she has in fact been um, head of 32 independent nation states as opposed to being a colonial monarch. So I'm not talking about her in a colonial sense. These are independent State. So as this um, um, chart shows you, she has had 
a um, a significant amount of uh, prime ministers and uh, governors general. And if we, I just quickly show you the next um, chart. And this is where um, this these are states where the queen has been, but no longer is head of state. So altogether, uh, uh, by my, my calculations, th taking up to January this year, the Queen has um, had 179 Prime Ministers across the globe, formally serving her, again to emphasise, in an independent country, not a colonial one. This means that the UK only accounts for just under 8% of her um, of her prime ministers, she has also had a hundred and fifty nine men and women represent her as head of state. Um, so, in, usually this is a, the post of uh, governor general, uh, which is the term used. So, which is different from a governor. It's confusing, I know, but it's a, a governor general is more replicating her as opposed to having. Um, conspicuous executive power, although, as I, I argue, even a governor general does have explicit um, executive powers also. And these, this chart I've, I've shown you does not even cover the sub-federal uh, levels. So if we think of, say, Missouri, of course, has a, a governor and so on, as opposed to um, what's happening in the Senate or, or the president. In a similar vein, the Queen also has representatives in places like um, mm. New Brunswick in Canada, as well as at, in Ottawa at the Federal Centre. And this is also the case in places uh, like in the states of Australia. But also to, to further muddy the waters, also doesn't include places like Southern Rhodesia uh, and, and other, other informal parts of the empire, which, such as where um, Rob uh, works on, uh, which also had a, a post-colonial relationship where the Queen has these other uh, manifestations of regal uh, power. So anyway, I, I just put these charts here and I'm happy to uh, keep the slides with you so you can study this, but you can see there's it's a, a very global position, uh, so it's much more than just thinking of it as a, a English one. <clears throat> And, and what makes it um, also very interesting is that um, this, this, the idea, the template of the monarch, the template of the British system was very keenly studied by constitution makers and independence uh, fighters to create their, their own constitution. So though here and in this talk, I'm concentrating on states that kept the British system and were dominions or realms. This also carries forth to republics um, such as um, India, for example, which I will discuss uh, later. So um, think looking to the, the what I call these the rights of a head of state uh, of a vice regal head of state in political crises. So just to emphasize again, so a normal, so I'm, I, I, I can't remember if uh, Rob mentioned, but I'm a New Zealander. New Zealand is a, a realm, which means so it's very much an independent state. So the Queen's representative in, in New Zealand is a governor general, and there is um, the international poster girl, Jacinda Ardern, is the prime minister, who formerly has a similar relationship as Boris Johnson to the Queen. So it's replicated there. So I just wanted to emphasize that again. So anyway, these vice regal rights in uh, political crises are in some ways a, my attempt to modernize uh, Badgett's uh, famous articulation of the rights of the sovereign, which he was looking at the Victorian constitution around Queen Victoria, of course, which he wrote in 1867. So he said that the sovereign had three key rights, to be consulted, to warn, and to encourage. And these have gained, for those um, legal scholars among you, uh, gained a, you know, a, a formidable status, though not without critique, but nonetheless, it's an oft-repeated um, trinity of rights that are, are discussed 
there. But in my view, this doesn't really cover, not only does it not really cover uh, Britain in the, in, the, in the present sense, even if we take this up to the 20th century, but it certainly doesn't cover uh, the post-colonial and colonial uh, parts of, of, of the Commonwealth. And, and, and my, also my other point is that it doesn't go anywhere towards what could happen in a constitutional or political uh, crisis. As, as Disraeli said, the principles of the English Constitution do not contemplate the absence of personal influence on the part of the sovereign. And if they did, the principles of human nature would prevent the fulfillment of such a theory. And this is in some ways how, nonetheless, I'm trying to theorize how uh, things could be in these, uh, in these senses. And the, the wealth of history, both British, imperial and post-colonial, has led me to give these this new typology of where a someone like the Queen, again, we don't naturally think of her like this, but has oh, but her, her type of position in parliamentary states have the right to rule during a crisis, the right to uphold during a crisis, and the right to oblige. So now I'm going to um, look at this through some very quickly uh, through um, little different case studies from around uh, the world. So as I said uh, earlier, formally speaking, the Queen can uh, veto legislation, she can sack prime ministers, she can command the army, uh, she, can, uh, she can declare war, um, and she can um, do many, and she can reject or impose appointments, but she doesn't do it. Nonetheless, this is a formal power that still exists uh, for her. But we don't normally, well, British scholars at least, don't normally think of that in the modern uh, sense, even though the Queen has herself w witnessed as being Queen of uh, independent states where coups and, and other things have happened. And she's presided over uh, Marxist administrations, Muslim administrations, and even military uh, dictatorships. And this is a, an aspect which we sometimes forget. So I thought as I'm speaking to a largely an American audience, I would bring up something from closer to your uh, backyard. And this picture is of Sir Paul Schoon, who was the Governor General of um, Grenada in, in the Caribbean during the 1970s and 1980s. So in, in this, the small state of um, um, of Grenada, uh, there was a um, there was a since 1979 a the People's Revolutionary uh, Government, uh, which had at, as their head um, the, a prime minister, or a, he was originally um, had le had a left had led a leftist coup um, called Morris Bishop, and. Despite leading the school, despite having a Marxist uh, background, he uh, just did not change the constitution. He did not declare um, Grenada a republic or a Soviet state or anything like that. But nonetheless, the Americans, um, especially by the time um, Ronald Reagan uh, came to office, perceived that this was um, the danger of com communism uh, coming to their within their um, within the ambit of the, if you like the Monroe uh, area and and so uh, decided to intervene and launched an invasion um, well at least the Americans didn't call it an invasion but none, the, many of the Grenadians did and certainly Bishop did as well and d during this time um, Bishop was ev uh, eventually murdered. Um, and and the but the interestingly the U.S. Navy SEALs made it a mission priority when they went in 1983 of locating the Governor General, because as they uh, because Schoon after the, during this um, attack was seen as the sole remaining source of legitimacy in the in the country and just again to emphasize Governors General are never elected they are appointed often in very murky. 
uh, antiquarian uh, ways. They have no um, uh, mandate, a formal mandate from the people. But anyway, with the murder of Bishop uh, Sir Paul Schoon, with the convivience of the Americans and, and American backing and allies in the region, became the executive power of, of, um, of the country. So that was an example where a governor general, the Queen's representative, uh, took the right to rule, which again, to emphasize, was perfectly legal. It was not an illegal action that he took because formal power was with him. Now, moving to Australia. Now, this is literally a photo of a drunken uh, governor general here, the, Sir John Kerr, who was a picture of him at the Melbourne Cup, famous horse racing uh, festivity in, on the Australian um, calendar. And uh, Kerr was a very um, controversial person, although in some ways he should be a very obvious person to be governor general, someone above politics. He was a, a former judge, former chief justice of the state of New South Wales, and had been appointed to the post by uh, the Labour Prime Minister, the recently elected Prime, uh, uh, Labour Prime Minister, Gough Whitlam, to be governor general in 1972. Now, again, in some ways, thinking of, um, well, some of the issues in America at the moment, and certainly in the recent past in the States of having disputes between two houses. And America, Australia also has a Senate and a, and a powerful uh, Senate. And that was dominated by the, uh, uh, the Liberal Party, the Conservative-like party of Australia, whereas the lower house, uh, the popular elected house uh, was uh, was had a majority of Gough Whitlam's party, the Labour Party, and there was massive intransigence between those two, which caused a budgetary crisis. Again, something that Americans know very well, in, the, in terms of the formal responsibilities of either house of Congress. Um, and anyway, in the in the Australian sense, um, the Governor General decided to use that right that he had. So usually it's just a ceremonial function of choosing a prime minister, whoever wins the election. Sir John Kerr decided and said to sack Gough Whitlam on, um, on remember, what's called Remembrance Day on the 11th of November 1975, which was a hugely controversial act uh, of sacking a prime minister without warning and then inviting the leader of the opposition uh, to become Prime Minister. So this shocked uh, not just Australians, but those across the world. And as, as I can maybe chat in the um, Q&A, it still is something of a recent discussion about some of the files of how much the palace was potentially involved. But this had ma major ramifications about the Crown's autocratic power. My final example from the right to rule <clears throat> from um, from um, is from Pakistan, which was also a had a, if you like, a, a dominion realm type system just before the advent of um, military dictatorship in 1958. So for almost the first 10 years of uh, Pakistani independence, um, there was the queen was head of state represented by a um, governor general. Now, as I was saying earlier, there, there's this, there is the formal potential of the monarch in Britain to veto uh, legislation, but that hasn't been done in Britain since Queen Anne did it in 1708. <clears throat> in Pakistan, this was very different. Now, the creator founder of Pakistan, Muhammad Ali Jinnah, um, Interestingly, when it, Pakistan became independent and largely at his, um, his, his insistence, he did not become prime minister, which would normally be the post you would think someone like him would take and his counterpart Nehru did take in India. He instead became governor general. And this was um, par partially to do with the idea that the crown had had such awesome power 
in colonial India, which of course covered Pakistan, that there was this idea that the that Jinnah as governor general would also exercise the powers of what was the post in India known as the Viceroy, which had more powers than any uh, British prime minister could have even in the heyday of empire over the fate of millions upon millions. And this person here in the wheelchair is the Pakistani governor general in the 1950s, um, Ghulam uh, Muhammad, who was um, who was governor general there after so Jinnah had died in 1948 and Ghulam Muhammad was sent legislation uh, from the constituent assembly which would have uh, circumscribed many of his powers and you know the convention would be that he would just sign it even though he wouldn't like it but instead of doing that he decided to dissolve the constituent assembly before it could give him the act and instead installed a prime minister and an assembly that would do his bidding and um uh, he 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 uh, showed you know in by doing this show the awesome power of a governor general or the queen's representative in such situations and indeed one of the most what was described by time magazine um as one of the most popular coups in uh, at the time in 1953 was when um Gul um Gula Muhammad also uh, decided to sack um, a prime minister in Khwaja Nazimuddin, who was, um, who he felt was not up to it, uh, and and did not, um, and was not doing a good enough job. So then, and when they resisted and tried to stop Gula Muhammad from sacking him, the governor general then, on his orders, surrounded um, the prime minister's house, um, cut off the telephone lines and surrounded the Prime Minister's house with the Governor-General's guards to make sure that there was not any uh, dereliction from his orders, showing again the raw power that can be from a Governor-General, which I argue, uh, and I'm arguing in another project, had major path-dependent uh, impact on Pakistani politics and democracy, or the lack of it, even though it actually happened under a democracy. So now I move to my second um, um, right, which is the right to uphold. So often we think of the crown uh, and 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 uh, heads of state as being guardians uh, of the constitution and having being above politics and having this um, almost fiduciary type role in in over um, their states. And this now this is a a portrait by a New Zealand artist of um, Sapanaya Ganalau, who was the Governor General, Ratu Sapanaya Ganalau, who was the Governor General of Fiji and also was a traditional chief uh, of, of Fiji, hence the Ratu uh, title. And now um, Ganalau was Governor General during, um, in 1987, when Two coups occurred. Two coups occurred in Fiji by um, a, a colonel in the Fijian army called uh, Rambuka, and he was very worried, uh, Rambuka, that in the recent election he was fearful that the um, that it would give the um, Indian community in um, Fiji the ability to form a government because they had won just enough seats. To form what to form their own uh, government, so Rambuka launched a coup to try and um, forestall this. Now the Governor General um, uh, Gunalau uh, did his best to try and maintain the democratic norms of the constitution, but and even and the Queen, interestingly, who normally never uh, intervenes in such um, in politics nonetheless sent a formal statement saying um, that was said that, that Her Majesty continues to regard the Governor General as her representative and the sole legitimate source of executive authority in Fiji. And then she said, 
anyone who seeks to remove the Governor General from office would in effect be re repudiating his allegiance and loyalty to the Queen. And so this was, uh, and this in a very chiefly uh, and monarchical type culture of Fiji's, this actually carried a great deal of force, but was not in the end uh, enough to, to save um, Fiji from having a coup, which eventually um, the, 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 the Ganalao as, as a chief and governor general resigned since he had said he was no longer able to maintain the principles of cabinet government. Now, moving, uh, moving just north of the border uh, for you, uh, thinking of um, Canada. So no, as, in some ways, not all cases that I'm describing need to be so dramatic as the ones I've um, described. And our good friends in Canada are not always uh, in the need of having evocative drama um, compared to the rest of us. But, in, in, but interestingly, we come to some of these ideas of where a ceremonial head of state the parliamentary head of state can involve, be involved in very uh, important issues of guardianship of the constitution. So and this is this is um, uh, sorry, this is a picture of uh, Michel Jean in in uh, as governor general who had who is Haitian um, heritage and was the the Queen's representative in Canada next to um, Stephen Harper sitting there uh, who was the um, Conservative Prime Minister of Canada. So in 2008, um, Stephen Harper at the election there, um, Stephen Harper emerged with his party emerged with the most seats in the Canadian uh, House of Commons. Uh, but this was only enough to form a, a minority government. So the, the three opposition parties collectively had more seats than Harper and thought of um, ha ha holding a vote of no confidence, which is an ability in Westminster-style democracies, to bring down Harper and instead install themselves as a coalition together. Now, Harper went to see uh, Jean at Rodeo Hall, the Governor General's residence in Ottawa, um, and requested a prorogation, which is a mechanism to effectively suspend Parliament. Usually it's done for technical reasons as opposed to, to controversial ones. But he did this so that the opposition would not be able to vote uh, to bring down his government. So that would be preserving the life of his administration despite uh, the democratic right of uh, the opposition to pull um, such um, an a, a a, a so-called vote. So Jean um, apparently didn't usually often in these situations, a governor general might just say yes without worrying about any of the circumstances because usually they're see, seen as almost nodding automatons. But in this case, Jean decided to reduce the time that um, Harp had asked for the prorogation and stipulated that when parliament convened after the prorogation, the government must face a vote of no confidence on the budget. So it wasn't a, it wasn't a rejection of Harper, but it was nonetheless um, her assertion of the Governor General's right that um, had this uh, fiduciary power, if you like, and was not an insignificant one. Now, moving to Africa uh, now, and this is this is to Syria uh, Leone. So again, thinking of elections, normally it's a very easy thing for a head of state in Westminster style democracies. Someone wins the most seat, then the governor general who has the formal right to choose um, the prime minister. Normally it's easy, it's just the person who wins the most uh, seats. So in March 1967, in the um, again, the independent state of Sierra Leone, the governor general sitting in the middle there with the um, striped, traditional striped trousers, um, Sir Henry Lightfoot uh, Johnson, who was a former judge, uh, believed that the results show that the incumbent prime minister, 
Sir Albert Margai sitting next to him with the interesting hat of the Sierra Leone uh, People's Party had less seats than the main opposition party led by Siaka Proben Stevens and consequently, as you would imagine the easy thing, invited the leader of the opposition to become prime minister because he had won the most seats. Instead, um, Brigadier David Lansana, the army commander and a known supporter and kinsman of the incumbent Prime Minister Margai did not agree and instead he commanded the, his troops to surround the Governor-General's residence and place the Queen's representative under house arrest. Interestingly then in 48 hours a counter coup occurred um, and formed of senior officers from the National Reformation uh, Council which interestingly again like Grenada decided to keep the Queen still as head of state. Um, and, 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 and they formally said in an executive action called Section 57 that Her Majesty had not been suspended by the military. But interestingly, throughout all of this and rather odd ideas of having the Queen presiding over military governments, Sir Henry, who had tried to uphold constitutional government in the West African country was, though eventually released from prison, never was um, restored to office nor given any thanks from either Queen or his country. Now the final right I have is the right uh, to, the, to oblige. So this is about basically thinking of where it's easy in some ways when something's very controversial to just do what the government tells you to do, even though it is in some ways going against your oath of office to uphold the rights of all citizens of um, the um, country. Now, this is a picture I have here of uh, the first female prime minister in the world, uh, Siramavo Bandaranaika of uh, Ceylon, Sri Lanka who was prime minister, became prime minister in um, 1960. And uh, next, her, next to her, she is holding the government's legislative program to the governor general, Sir Oliver uh, Gunathelika. <clears throat> now, um, I, I in some ways um, uh, have misdirected you, but since I'm not going to talk about Mrs. Bandaranaika, but I'm going to talk more about Gunathelika. So as you probably are aware, Sri Lanka has had uh, major ethnic tensions between the Sinhalese majority and the Tamil uh, minority. And Mrs. Bandaranaika's husband, when he came to office in 1956, um, he uh, put, a, put forward legislation called the Singhala Only Act, which was to completely um, stop any linguistic equality or parity for the Tamil speaking uh, minority. And the Governor General um, had formal powers in the Constitution to, um, to, to take, take special attention of minorities. But instead, this, this, you would think this would raise red flags, the removal of the linguistic rights of a minority. But nonetheless, the Governor General, uh, Gunathelika, who came from the same ethnic community as uh, Bandaranaika, decided to pass the legislation without any, and give the royal assent without any qualms whatsoever. And again, that arguably led, that, that law at least, to the subsequent civil war, which wrecked um, Sri Lanka for um, over 20 years. Now we move to um, somewhere where the to 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 Ireland, which um, re resonates again also, which is another interesting case. So we don't often think of of and this is sorry, this is a picture of Eamon de Valera, uh, who was the famous Irish leader who was very much against, uh, very much for getting rid of the British and getting rid of the crown from Ireland. But interestingly, when he uh, did become um, effectively like a um, prime minister in 1932, 
he um, he saw the con convenience of having the crown since of this power that it had there. So he decided to um, decided to appoint a complete placeman as as uh, governor general in in Dublin, uh, who a, a former Gaelic uh, school teacher to be and and this and 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 um, Domnal Bukhala um, did everything that was asked of him, including residing in a modest suburban house instead of the instead of the Grand Viceregal Lodge. He accepted an eighty-five percent reduction in his officer's budget, and operated in complete ignorance of government files, and concluding those commuting a death sentence, despite all of those things being his responsibility to look over. He did whatever de Valera um, told him to do and not being uh, included or involved in any of the ceremonies normally associated with a head of state. So this was uh, this was in some ways a very expedient device uh, used here in the Irish example. The final um, case that I um, have for you is is looking at India. Now, as I mentioned before, Jinnah, there's a picture of Jinnah uh, there with his sister on the um, far right there. And in between them is Lord and Lady uh, Mountbatten. Now, Mountbatten had been uh, Viceroy of India and um, most recently seen probably in the crown to most of you. Um, and he, uh, it was his wish that when India and Pakistan became independent, in 1947 that he would become a super governor general his words of both the new states of pakistan and india but jinnah again coming back to him and his ideas of taking the governor general ship himself perceived that mountbatten was biased towards the nehru's and the hindu um was he saw the hindu party the indian national congress and rejected Mountbatten's um, demand uh, request to become Governor General of both states. Now, this this instead meant that um, Nehru. Um, so he, but Mountbatten did become Governor General of India on independence. But by him taking that place and by having this image of being so close to Nehru and so close to the. Uh, Congress party, he was not seen as being above politics. And therefore, it, it meant that there was this disabled, if you like, any potential meaningful cooperation that could have occurred between the two states. And of course, arguably, um, not Mountbatten directly, but some, well, some people do argue this, that this was a, one of the causes of this distrust of having Mountbatten as governor general caused and listening to what Nehru said caused the conflict and wars that uh, happened during those early years, especially around the fraught and contested state of Kashmir, which was very close to Nehru's heart. <clears throat> so I've uh, given you a rather global tour of um, so much of, um, of of this type of concept, but I, I, I in many ways, I've, I've tried to do this to to give you an idea of, of, of the many manifestations and, I, and ways that the crown can be in a political sense and even in a post-colonial one. So not uh, as a colonial monarch, but in a post-colonial. And interestingly, I think even though I obviously mentioned the queen at the beginning, it's really the local actors that make the weather in their in their um, in their own particular case studies, but they are building on British and imperial and colonial history uh, in in so doing, and these still have long long legacies, even for states that no longer have um, the Queen as uh, head of state. So, like somewhere like India, as I mentioned, um, though India was only a very brief time a dominion until 1950. Nonetheless, the awesome power of the Viceroy uh, and the Crown has modern day legacies in the powers that the um, 
Indian president has, which was literally a uh, and consciously a copy and paste job from the provisions of the crown in the colonial constitution of India that went into the Republican constitution of India. And they even the in Indian legal experts wanted to mirror um, the monarch and saw George VI, the Queen's father, as their template, but that was not to be. Instead, we saw more the templates of like a Kazonian vice royalty where the president or the prime minister through the president used huge autocratic power over the Indian states, such as suspending um, democracy in places like uh, Kashmir, but also in more populous places like uh, Bengal. So these bring real history there. This is a picture of Rambuka, who I mentioned earlier, the coup leader of Pakistan and uh, sorry of Fiji uh, and and the Queen in 1997. Interestingly, um, uh, ten years after the military coups in Fiji, uh, Rambuka, um, who had led them, as I mentioned. Um, remembered meeting his erstwhile head of state and commander-in-chief in London at Clarence House. In his words, he said, I asked if she would like to become Queen of Fiji. She said very simply, let it be the will of the people. So I offered a traditional apology, the present presentation of a tabua, which is a polished tooth of a sperm whale. And then when we were talking, I asked her if she would agree for Fiji to approach her again to become our queen. And then she said, let it be the will of the people. Now I mentioned these lines um, mainly because this shows in some ways how much history is entwined with the crown and its curious manifestations uh, of it across the world. So it has a very, even though Fiji has been a republic uh, for and, 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 and had military government for many years, it still saw this uh, linkages for better or for worse with the crown and the real history that comes with it. So I hope this idea of this con concept that I've tried to put forth of vice regalism shows that the examination of heads of state as political actors in the post-colonial world is an important one in the histories and politics of the states uh, they work in, especially during crises. It also shows the complexities of a position at the core of states around the world performing a variety of political roles on distinctive and demanding uh, stages. And there is, in some ways, a crown for all seasons. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Harsha. Thank you very much indeed. Um, Thank you. Well, I'm going to exercise my uh, prerogative as as chair to to ask the first question. But if I can just remind everybody, if you would uh, like to ask a question, please do send me a message in the chat or use the raise hand function, and I'll keep a little note uh, and get round to uh, everybody uh, in turn. Um, but if I can uh, if I can start by uh, asking a, a question uh, to you, Harshan. So there's a very nice relationship you're drawing out here between what this concept of, of you're putting forward of, of vice regalism and really the history of decolonization um, and that this is something which is a kind of reserved power which becomes visible in these moments of, of political crisis in particular although as you say it can actually be more of a sort of mundane function of crisis it can just simply be when governments change rather than uh, a sort of more dramatic coup has to occur um, but I want to ask a question which uh, I know you've written about before uh, and which I think uh, you know, you've probably got quite a bit to say on, but this does go back to the ultimate kind of uh, example of a crisis of decolonization blowing back upon the British Isles itself, namely Brexit. And that enormous debate that came up about the Queen's responsibilities vis-a-vis -vis prorogation of Parliament and of course the case that then followed. So I wondered if you could uh, sketch out for us how you see that uh, whole issue in the context of the exercise of this form of power, particularly the context of it being exercised in cases of decolonization, which you know I really do think is a, a useful way to think about why those tensions in the Brexit debate took the form that they did. Um, but 
I wondered if we could get your take on on the whole prorogation uh, situation. And in fact, it might be very useful for people just to quickly outline what was at stake in that particular moment of crisis. Sure. Thank. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. And thanks for the the question. Well, the um, the 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 prorogation crisis was one of um, in in twenty nineteen in the summer of twenty nineteen where. Uh, basically, the government of Boris Johnson, who had just not had just um, replaced Theresa May as prime minister, um, came to office. But he basically had a parliament and party which was largely um, in favour of staying in the European Union, um, which meant he was unable to get his program or affecting Brexit in the way he wanted to, at least, uh, through that parliament. So his his idea um, was to prorogue uh, parliament in the summer of August um, of um, 2019. So to basically rule um, and exercise his power and, and uh, run Britain without the uh, disturbances, if you like, of, uh, of parliament. So, um, so when he did this, there was um, discussion of what, what, yes, what the Queen would do. And there were, had been a lot of discussion beforehand because it had been discussed that this might happen, but no one had said, no one knew it was going to happen, at least not in the inner circle, uh, outside the inner circle. Um, but the people on the Remain side who were saying that um, Johnson had done... Uh, was being utterly against the constitutional norms and the Queen should uh, remove him. Uh, and there were also those on the Brexit side of things who also believed the Queen should uh, intervene and, um, and, and you know, make a statement that either that Brexit will happen or that, um, yes, prorogue uh, Parliament. And um, and and in the end, uh, within um, hours, not even days, um, of by telephone, um, a request. So it wasn't even done as is customary. Uh, an audience is requested, and usually the usually if it's just a technical thing, the Queen will do it probably very quickly. But in this, but in these, these circumstances, in my view, it would have been quite. Um, uh, understandable if the Queen had taken more time to do it, especially when um, a critical principle of responsible government in the Westminster sense is that the, the Prime Minister is able to advise the monarch to exercise all these types of powers because they have a majority of the popular house, and Britain being the House of Commons. Now, Johnson had lost every single vote at that stage, so it's a moot point whether he had that uh, power, that responsibility, if, if, as, to use the term, constitutional term, to advise the monarch as such. So which, coming back to viceregalism, would mean the Queen, because he doesn't have that, the Queen does have scope, because the responsibility is in question, to exercise her prerogative, which could be as little as asking for the legal justification from uh, the law officers which was um, not published at that time. So, but instead the Queen acted very quickly and controversially, at least from some perspectives, to sign off on the prorogation. And I just, as a quick thing, I know I've probably gone too long than you wanted, Rob, but she, it's also interesting to think that as I did in another piece that Rob's referring to, if this had been say, Queen Victoria or George V, uh, it may have been a very different action uh, that we could have seen, let alone thinking of it someone like Charles I. Mm. But it does come down again, as Disraeli said, as I hopefully have tried to say, on the personalities involved. And arguably, if the Queen was, um, say, earlier in her reign or more younger and perhaps less um, as, a, as a, you know, non-Nigerian, non uh, may... Um, may have been, you know, more keen to assert her guardianship role. Because if we go back to the dismissal case, it was almost seen as a, a principle that no prime minister or 
controversial action of the Crown could be done by phone. It had to be done with written advice, which was absent in this um, case. Great, thank you. Um, all right, we have a question uh, now from one of our MA students from Thai. Um, Thai, do you want to jump on? There he is. Hi, um, thank you for that talk. I've never seen, so firstly, I'm a British student, but I'm just studying in Missouri. Um, and I've never seen kind of a comparative analysis of governor generals before. So I thought that was really interesting. I guess my question is, do you see this more of a kind of a political science analysis in the same way one might compare presidential with a semi-presidential to parliamentary systems? Or would you see it more of a kind of historical analysis where all these countries have ultimately shared the same queen for the last however many years that they come from the same historical origins? Because I do wonder that whenever I've seen this discussed in the past, it always seems that developments within the country in question always have the overriding influence in how the governor generals operate. Like I saw in Canada recently, their governor general got kicked out due to some kind of um, toxic workplace scandal. And that to me seems like a very Canadian story rather than one which we could, let's say, talk about how governor generals generally resign, for example. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Ty. And yes, very, very good question. Well, I, sometimes I see it as a, a mixture. It, it is um, uh, very much it is, a, it is in some ways a bit of comparative politics, but it is one which I've tried to very much um, drawn from history and the, the, the colonial genesis, if you like, of, of and so if we even if we take the Canadian case, um, you know, there are lots of examples from, um, say, the 19th century where um, things have could have, have been very different and where governors general took more um, assertive uh, roles, but it's also, I think, um, an example of where, say, is the example you're bringing up of Trudeau and his uh, problems with the yeah, this workplace scandal in Canada. It's also about prime ministers, I think, as well, because we, uh, I mean, I, as far as I'm aware, most probably many would think that, say, an American president, say has more power than a prime minister, the British prime minister or the Canadian prime minister, because the roles of head of state and head of government are combined in a, an American president, whereas in a, a parliamentary democracies, they are split between head of state as the governor general or someone like that and a prime minister. But in many ways, if uh, in the, this, this Canadian idea aspect, the, if, if uh, if a if a, um, if a if a governor general is just there to do exactly what the prime minister says, then there is no real check uh, from someone. So, like this Boris Johnson example, there is no one institutionally. There are people politically, but there's no one institutionally who can check uh, what has happened. So it is. So, but then uh, coming to back to your point about history or politics, in some ways, if we look at history. And one of the other things, I, I'm actually also co-editing the Cambridge Constitutional History of the United Kingdom. And if, so if you look back, we take more of a broader sense, there is very much, there's plenty of precedents where these things happen, but we have forgotten in some ways, both prime ministers and heads of state of their historical potential and pitfalls of their respective roles. Thank you. Uh, thanks. I, I won't ask if you think Britain would be better served if we had a governor general, but um, that, that may be implied by your by your answer. Um, uh, I think next on my list is Merve. Uh, Merve, please. Allow him to go first. <laughs> oh, I saw. I think we missed the start of what you were saying, Merve. Sorry. Oh, sorry. I, I just said I think Connor was waiting before I had. Oh, to sorry. Him. Okay, so right. Yes. Okay. Go ahead sure. Okay. Uh, Connor. Sure, sorry, Connor first. The way the order shows up with the raise hand function. Yeah, I, um, yeah. I, get, I get confused at the best of times. Connor, please. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, th thanks, Merve. That's very, very nice. Um, uh, thanks, Harshan. This is really, really stimulating, kind of a tour de force in so many different areas. So thank you uh, for that. I have two questions. Feel free to take, take one or both. One picks up on what Ty was just asking, and it picks up on um, the initial uh, chart you shared about the number um, of governors general and uh, prime ministers. And I was struck by uh, those numbers are in many cases pretty close. So I started wondering about the relationship between 
the governor general as an institution or an individual and domestic politics. Um, and to stay on Canada, for example, <clears throat> which I just happen to know some, some details about, um, the selection, for example, of a, a Canadian born person, right, didn't happen until the 1950s, and then rotation between Francophone and Anglophone. So I was wondering, in, kind of in a larger scope, whether there are patterns uh, in the evolution of the selection, um, or, or the replacement and the turnover of governors general, um, and whether there's a dimension there that connects to domestic politics about what's going on, or if this is just purely a relationship between the crown and whatever political system uh, we're talking about. The second question uh, picks up on, I really like the kind of the threefold right to rule, right to uphold, right to oblige, but to push back a little bit, I, I, it seems somewhat odd to call the right to oblige a right, at least given the examples that were used. So it seems to me um, that the Sri Lanka case was pretty awful, you know, it was, it was maybe a failure, right? If, if, we're gonna, if we're going to evaluate it and Ireland seems just like trying to cling to hold on India similarly right there it's it's such a fraught case so I wonder if it if it might not more properly be thought of or if there's an aspect here of um, an imperative to oblige so that the other rights can be exercised and so I think one way of putting it is what's the justification for thinking of those as rights realizing that there are huge questions of British constitutionalism at stake uh, in that question thank you so much uh, Connor those are you you St stimulating stuff um, very much. Well, very um, quickly, and you, know, you you brought up some great great points. Um, we, as you say, the, the 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 numbers are quite close, and and that that does mirror in some ways that the reality is, and when the uh, when um, yes, as you say, Britain stopped being appointed to these viceregal posts in uh, well, at least in the um, the so-called old dominions in the from Canada early, but in New Zealand, Australia, it's not until the 60s it carries on. Uh, but then they're usually replaced by um, people who are from politics. So it almost um, uh, renders the idea of this person being above politics as um, as as you know um, the antithesis of it. And that and and if we go, if if I may uh, go to the other part of the neighborhood, if you like, the Caribbean, you see, and it's, a, you know, it's almost an explicit change. So when a new government comes in, they replace the governor general and bring uh, someone from their own party in. And this brings to the, to the fore that um, uh, there is no legal obligation or parliamentary scrutiny other than by custom, if at all, for the selection of whoever this person will be. So it's only between the private office of uh, Buckingham Palace and in Canada's case, the Prime Minister's office in Ottawa. But, and it would be only, the, the, the Crown would very rarely say no in the modern sense, at least. So that means, yes, there's often a political convenience or at least a showcasing convenience that comes there. Um, which interestingly with uh, Trudeau's recent um problems uh there had that the usual customs in canada had not been followed so it was usually consulting with the opposition but this didn't happen um in this case um well i suppose um i i absolutely see your point and and you may not uh, um maybe i didn't articulate myself well enough but i absolutely see the third right obliging as a failure so it's in some ways the right to do nothing it's 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 uh, um, it's 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 also yes it's a it's a, it's a very much a negative right. It's not a it's it's more to think of rights in so, in some ways as an option as opposed to um, something that is manifestly principled, which it certainly is is not. And 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 that that that's uh, these are um, as you say very uh, disturbing uh, cases which have, um, well, have long, because interestingly, in, in, in divided societies like Sri Lanka um, and in the African, many of the African cases as well, um, and, and other parts of Asia and India too, there was usually the head of state was given extra provisions in their 
um, if not if not formal law, but in the, the you know the instructions to look after the uh, space, give special attention to to minorities, and this was almost never uh, followed in the post-colonial sense in terms of defending the rights of minorities. And um, yes, it's un, it's a it's a definitely a negative right, and it's a it's a very shameful one. But I nonetheless wanted to put it there, not as a as like a, um, a, a more for illustrative purposes, as opposed to saying this is what they should have. I should say again, these are not what I think the Governor General should have or head of state should have. It's more from studying history. These are the, 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 the ways that these are taken and also that they can be seen in different ways, you know, as well, because obliging can some for some mean upholding. Um, and and uh, for others, it might see as ruling. So they're, they're very um, messy, I should say, from the outset. Thank you. Uh, Merve, now, sorry. <laughs> yeah, cheers. Thanks, Ben. Um, I, I had a question. Thanks again. It was fascinating. Um, that is a bit more from the sort of histories of decolonization perspective and what this offers us um, with uh -huh. respect to that. Uh, and I, I, I guess, so this is kind of a provocation, but you use the word dominion, and in some ways what it seems like you're offering is a case for us not to think about some of these ongoing relationships within the Commonwealth as neo-colonial ones, but that they're literally still dependencies. You know, they're still dominion states in, in various kind of legal ways, that's still the case. And so I guess if, if that's true then, kind of how do you think that this, um, impacts the sort of unevenness of dominion histories and dependencies within the empire. And, and even, I mean, if you wanted to think about Brexit as well, you know, the, the hopes that Australia will fill the vacuum that Europe once did, you know, that the way that figures, you know, the, way the I was struck by the chart that you provided, which on the one hand seems to flatten all those dependencies in a kind of single frame. And yet there continues to be this kind of uneven focus and the way that power is, is sort of distributed across those same governor generals. So I'm just wondering if you can speak to that a bit more. Sure, thank you. Thank you very much. Well, um, well, the, I mean, um, I, I, with the term, I suppose the term dominion is one that is still, um, you know, has legislative, legislative significance for, and interestingly was seen as, um, um, you know, the terminology of the early 20th century is the highest form of self-government in the British Empire. So, um, and interestingly, um, when Fiji became independent in 1970, it actually wanted to it, it, it wanted to use the word dominion of Fiji in the 70s because it was seen as the highest form, even though the term had been uh, you know, out of use really in most of the um, most of the Commonwealth by that time, but it was it was very much up to uh, personal usage in that sense. It wasn't a legally mandated uh, title, um, and yes, I suppose from a, well, I suppose if you look at it from a British perspective, yes, there is a a um, temptation to see these, these as dependencies and um, states that have um, a formal allegiance or obligation to uh, Britain. But um, these are still very much localized contexts. And the, the, um, the British context of uh, Brexit is in some ways rather ignorant, I think, of, of the realities in in places like Australia or elsewhere, where there is, um, in some ways, the um, a form of Brexit occurred in July 1961, when uh, Britain first applied for um, application uh, to the EEC by Macmillan. So that was, in some ways, the 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 flag, the, the indicated to many of these countries that it was time to look elsewhere, even though um, formally the constitutional system hasn't changed. Uh, so there is still keeping the Queen, for example, as head of state. But again, in places like the 16 places that have the Queen as head of state still, um, 
she is there formerly as um, say New Zealand or Jamaica or Papua New, New Guinea as say like the Queen of Papua New Guinea uh, rather than the Queen of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. So there is a different identity even though that is very difficult to demarcate in a cultural and identity sense in, in, in those places. Thank you. Right, I think we now have a question from uh, another of our MA students, Mary Grace Newman. Hello, thank you so much for this talk. I really enjoyed it. And something I was pondering during this Q&A uh, part of the discussion was the interaction between different governor generals and whether they collaborate with each other to understand their own roles and these various rights that you present. Thank you very much, um, Mary Grace, for, for your question. Um, well, that's a, one of the interesting things is that um, uh, almost all of these uh, people who took the office of Governor General complained that there's almost no guidance whatsoever uh, for how to do things. There's usually decaying uh, volumes of Anson or Dicey or Jennings or others which have you know, almost no relevance for the local situation uh, there and and, and um, coming back to Connor's question, in some ways, where many of these people come from a had come from a political background, and so used to you know the the civil service being able to provide detailed advice, and um, often because of the p ambit of things like the Foreign Office or the Commonwealth Office or the Dominions Office had you know a wealth of precedents to draw on even if inept or wrong. But when they become governors general, usually there's you know one person, even in big places like Canada um, or, or even in India, there's the, when it was like that, there was there's very little staff uh, or techs. And um, yeah, again, unlike say the American presidency where there's, you know, gosh, I don't know how many, you know, how many, um, square kilometers could be taken up by books on the American presidency, but you don't see that even about the monarchy in Britain, let alone the um, uh, king or queen's representative. There's just an absence, which was, um, without sounding, I hope not sounding arrogant, that's made my job quite difficult because I also, for me, meant it was difficult to um, bring in all this literature together of, individual states. So in a similar vein, coming back to your question, Mary Grace, there was very little interaction. Although interestingly, there was ideas about, in some of this global post-colonial moment of getting, so with someone like Nkrumah wanted, had the idea of getting a, instead of getting an Englishman to be governor general, wanted to get a um, Oliver Gunathelica, who I showed a picture of from Salon to come there some way so is that the non-white and non-european potential of the office which was never realized but interestingly he also was thinking of this because he didn't want uh, to have a Ghanaian at all because he didn't want anyone that could rival his hold in the state so it could only be someone as an outsider so in the end he got a, a Fabian Anglo-Irish aristocrat in uh, Lord Lestol but yeah so that 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 I part was never um, realized, um, Mary Grace. But one last thing for you, but they still, to this day, write letters uh, to the Queen about which, which the Prime Minister doesn't see. And there's, I'm sure some of that information is shared, but um, we, <laughs> we probably won't know until I'm long dead if, that's, um, if that actually happens or not. Thank you so much. It's a, it's a really great question. Actually, it gives us a little window into um, actually the difficulties of you writing on this as a historian writing on the, the era of decolonization. Um, somebody's just popped up to say they've got a, a follow up question to Mary Grace's question. So Morgan, please. Morgan, do you have a question? Yes. Hi. Um, this has been uh, very interesting, but I kind of have a follow up to Mary Grace's question here, which is, I guess, how powerful were these individuals if there's not much written on them before, you know, that doesn't mean to say they weren't powerful individuals, but 
it there, do, there just doesn't seem to be they just seem to be forgotten even even possibly today so i guess just like what power do they wield thank you thank you very much um morgan um well they they did as you say yes did and as i hope my talk tried to illustrate at least have significant power um but uh yes it's 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 um and and linking to rob's um question as well uh it, it meant you know it, it, um extracting if you like the national story uh and taking it into a, a global context but it was also in some ways more than that because sometimes these aren't really even known in the local context so it meant studying um looking at newspapers some legal documents and um, old-fashioned archives that are available uh, there but it, it, it is um it's an imperfect picture uh because the, 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 there is not um, a great deal because usually you know again like thinking of america there's things on you know the president as opposed to um I, I, it's not really an equivalent but like say the vice presidency um you know in the sense you know the, the big office is looked at so in a similar sense in in my way the the, the queen or the prime minister is studied but not um the governor general so that meant it um yes it was difficult and there, there is there is not much um it's only a, a, not much written at all uh, on on this stuff to reiterate again but thank you for your question thanks okay next question is from uh, jay sexton jay oh yeah thank you very much for that i i enjoyed it very much and my question is about the very sort of last line there when you had the the queen saying, you know, if the people want, to, it's if it's the will of the people. And I mean, very much it was a story of sort of high politics, wasn't it, and, and leaders. And I can understand why uh, leaders either in Britain or in the various places you discussed um, saw utility in reaching back to this sort of old hoary colonial institution and they could repurpose it for whatever whatever the um, objective of the day was. But I, I guess I wonder if it matters what the people think. Do, do the people fit into this story um, in, in, in any sense? Or is that um, obviously, is it, is it something that varies from place to place and from time to time? And then my, my sort of coda to this is always my question on this topic. I just don't understand why um, the monarchy has um, generated such traction and indeed support in so many different places all the way to this day, but also historically, um, and th this might be fighting words for, for Jeff Pasley, maybe we'll lure him into this conversation, but I, I think that the, um, you know, in, in, in revolutionary and 19th century America, there is far more monarchism and support for the monarchy, um, e e even, even of an anti-colonial kind of pro-monarchy sentiment then is often realized and then and then obviously in more recent times i mean that shock 1999 australian re referendum um you know and i i've heard many theories that this was because of there was fissures within the republican ranks and so forth but still at the end of the day they voted to keep it so i guess uh, I, I'm, I'm, that, I'm just perplexed on that i don't know if you have a canned answer to that but my bigger question is does popular legitimacy matter? Because, of course, these anti-colonial, uh, post-colonial societies is when, you know, the people are becoming engaged um, in politics in all kinds of new ways. I'm, so, I'm sorry, Jay, I, I lost some of your question, but I think I got enough about, uh, hopefully, but you feel free to interrupt me if I missed the last bit of it. But yes, the, 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 the question of the people especially is, one that um, is um, almost uh, scarily invisible in, in, in these uh, cases, other than when it becomes, um, when it's a major you know, public crisis and often, and interestingly, you, you, you could imagine in some ways that there'd be you know, discord when governors general do this sort of stuff, where, where they you know, take an almost autocratic type of thing. But as I mentioned, Somewhere like Pakistan, when those things were happening, it was seen by um, um, not just the people, but the CIA. I mean, not the, the CIA, the people, but the, the people of Karachi and so on as being extremely 
popular of like getting rid of a um un you know unresponsive government so it was seen as as very much part of it but then it also and this is also the case in Australia where I was mentioning that case of the dismissal of the prime minister where in some ways half the population were uh, utterly, you know, Republican and re feeling almost revolutionary about it. And the other half said, how dare the, they insult the crown and, 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 and the crown should do this. And there were plenty of supporters. It was very divisive um, in that case. And in some ways, I suppose these figures are able to act um, without the people, if you like, because there is no obligation for them to do so. There is no, it's not that there's no election, there is no um, uh, contract, there is no uh, method of speaking, you know, it's, it's ceremonial. So there's no, only the prime minister can, or the, can remove the person from office, or formerly the queen, but, so they're the person that it counts. And in, in terms of your, other point about you know why basically you know, why why the why if, if I understood you correctly about why the monarchy and why this um, um, ha happened and and I'm trying to remember the the book that uh, is it the Royalist Revolution isn't it by Nelson and and um, Nelson yeah yeah and 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 so and I suppose I I I, I think of that in some ways is because. Um, uh, it's it's in some ways not so much a royalism or uh, a love of monarchy or the crown, but it's more that there's the the vessel and institution and the if you like the studied ambiguity that surrounds the crown enables many people to use that mechanism, that existing mechanism, in so many different ways without having to do anything. Uh, revolutionary, like, you know, necessarily, you know, forge a new constitution or start a, uh, you know, a big referenda or having a constituent assembly or a Philadelphia moment. These things aren't required under the crown. So as I was mentioning, you can have something like a, you know, a, a Marxist government, a military government, all under the crown because it allows it. And in some ways, I think that's part of the explanation of why it has a a lingering power on uh, it's 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 in some it's as John Howard put it, uh, you know, in some ways unappealingly, in some ways, but still pragmatically, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Talking about Australia, so it's not that there's a necessarily you know a great fervent royalty among politicians about this, but it, they're able to do what they want within it, and it's in some ways harder to try and conceptualize uh, a potentially divisive constitution breaking moment um that would come from it is that what you uh, i because i is that what you wanted jay i wasn't sure yeah no that's exactly what i wanted and, and i mean i suppose i it, what i'm taking from this is it's it's a that there's um institutional political continuity and there's always a value uh, in that in a moment of crisis which you're zooming in on but i guess the second point is that it's precisely because it's um, undemocratic um the the vestiges of colonial rule that um the the governor general and vice regals and so forth have so much traction in these moments of crisis so um, yeah, maybe the people don't matter. Maybe that's the whole point. But the the code of my question was about, but yet some people do like the monarchy. And maybe that's mostly a, a settler Anglophone um, story of Australia and, and so forth. But I, I'll be forever perplexed by that. Well, as a quick, uh, quick, thing, quick response, if I may quickly, is that interestingly, is a you're absolutely right. But the, as usual with this, massive amount of cases there are always uh, other ways exceptions to this and one of them is say one of the reasons new zealand so my country where it, it's the easiest of all the states to change because like britain and israel it has an unwritten constitution so new zealand could do it tomorrow if it wished but interestingly it's not this not so much the settler population that which is actually maori because they see their compact 
with the Crown from the Treaty of Waitangi of 1840. And they see that the, um, they actually see the Crown, and don't get me wrong, it's an imperfect uh, conclusion, but nonetheless see the Crown as a, almost a buffer or safeguard against the local governments because say like restitution of land, uh, uh, Maori rights are with, formally with the Crown as opposed to the government, even though, of course, it's the government that does it. But there's somehow a principle uh, that this, and, and interestingly, someone was reminding me the other day in Belize, so in America's backyard, which still has the Queen as head of state, they don't want to become a republic because uh, that apparently would um, signal for Guatemala to uh, lay a claim to the whole territory. So having the Queen has a an international legal um, aid because of the conquest to the so there, it's, there, there are other parts to it, but yes, the settler part is the main one, but there are other parts too. Okay, uh, the uh, the switchboard's got a bit lively, uh, but we've got time for probably a couple more questions. I was going to ask you something else about decolonization and the way that you get these you know, sort of the Hanslope Park type context, if you like, but we'll park that. Um, Jeff's got a, uh, something he'd like to, to ask first, and then Connor's got something else he'd like to follow up on. So uh, Jeff first. Yeah, I was just trying to follow up, follow up, uh, follow up Jay's, Jay's question. And uh, clearly there, there are countries that aren't on the chart, right? The, the, there are Anglophone countries that, former colonies that, that rejected the Royal Connection, that didn't keep it around like, like Australia and Canada and uh, New Zealand and people who did it on different schedules. I wonder if there's anything that marks the rejection of all this. I mean, is there a way to talk about what, what factors or is there a factor that, that in common that leads, that leads people to not bother with governor generals and having the queen as a head of state and all that? Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for your uh, question, uh, Jeff. Um, yes, there is. I mean, it, interestingly, um, especially if we um look at africa for example where there was of course the the most amount of well on the, on one hand the most amount of rejections but also the most amount of um so-called realms as well numerically at least um and it was seen as a you know an easy stepping stone to in some ways linking to jay's question so it's more of expedience so that it was easier to get through um, the British Parliament and do things through the existing mechanism for independence if it was done through this way. And then some, so somewhere like Kenya, for example, within a year, it had uh, got rid of the um, Governor General to take on its and forward its own uh, republic. So the, and, and so, so th that's a, that's a, a, a strong uh part of it the utility aspect actually is, is 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 a major part of it and it was seen as the because often the negotiations for independence are often um uh, held up by questions of constitutional design and how you know what a parliament should look like what how the often a, often in the colonial sense there's a federal aspect which often links to ethnicity and religion and so how are these going to be protected so independence leaders saw including say like india pakistan and sri lanka um, as well saw the the ability of this to get what they wanted relatively quickly and with minimal uh, obligations to then go and get get full power without having to do it with the with the british and then forge their own Republican sort. But what's interesting is that other than those that went into full effective one party dictatorship, they often f uh, kept a Westminster style system where it was, you know, the governor general was instead a president, but not an executive president. Like so, India, as I was saying. Thank you. It's a big example. Thank you. Right. Okay. Last two questions then. Uh, Connor's got a, a, a question and then Erin has got one as well. So you, you're nearly there, Harshan. Home stretch. Home <laughs> I'm stretch. enjoying it. Thank you. <laughs> I'll, I'll try to be brief, but I, th I think what, what Jay said really 
put potentially put an interesting frame around this and it was one that was kind of rattling around but i didn't know how to articulate which is i think the big question is what are the precedents or constant kind of institutional consequences of actions like this but put alongside you know, non-Westminster or non-Eastminster systems compared to something like a presidential system, the question of locating executive power and emergency power is one of the most pressing, right? You know, legal questions, constitutional questions. And it, there's this interesting way in which at least the examples that you gave uh, was a way of uh, resolving crises, right? It was, it was some sort of institutional mechanism, but uh, I, the question is, did it have any downstream consequences? In the US, right, you have uh, aggrandizements of executive power that have fundamentally shaped the constitutional system, the structure and purpose of the executive. Um, it seems like this, you know, kind of sucks up some of that, <laughs> the, the drama, uh, and is either a release valve or something like that. But I, I, I can't know the answer to that unless I know whether, whether these actions have uh, consequences, whether they serve as as precedents in connection with uh, emergency powers or crises more broadly. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Connor. And and if I may, I might um, link your question to Jeff's as well, because um, I thought I, I might use the example of India, actually, because that is one that did eventually reject, um, reject the uh, monarchical system for a republic, obviously. And um, Yes, and 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 in some of my work on what I call Eastminsters. Um, so there's so in under the crown, India had, um, and this ex actually extends in some ways to Rob's and Ali's um, interests as well. Had paramountcy powers, of course. So there were there was in some ways a form of uh, devolved power to local leaders, but effectively the crown had that reserve colonial power, emergency power, uh, if you like, to intervene and did use it. But then when India became independent and became a republic, it was seen as those powers ended. Those powers ended. But in effect, um, even though India had rejected monarchy, had rejected um, those systems, and had, you know, got all the Indian princes, you know, the almost 600 Indian princely states to uh, join the Indian Union, um, they said that paramountcy was dead. So there was the state would no lot the centre would no longer have that intervening power, and um, and and Nehru when he was framing the constitution when it was becoming a republic uh, said that. And yet when the the provisions of the constitution actually mirror the colonial provisions, and Nehru said this was a dormant power and Ambedkar as well. You know the main one of the main authors of the Indian Republic Constitution, and so this was a dormant power just to preserve the Union in case there was invasion and of course partition uh, there. Anyway, to jump to your point about down the downstream effects, this dormant power was actually used over has been used over a hundred times since independence, and in the majority of those are in blatantly political against opponents or oppositions. And this is used through the president, not the prime minister and cabinet. So this is directly, at least my argument at least, directly coming and consciously coming from the powers that used to reside with the viceroy and governor general and are now still remain with the president. So even now, the recent suspension of, further suspension of rights in Kashmir are done by the president, which is the founders at least saw, or the Indian founders saw, as almost being a uh, ceremonial post. But this is coming back to our discussion earlier about obliging. Great, thanks. All right, Erin, last question from you. Okay, thank you so much for your talk. Um, and I really have to blame Jay and Jeff for, for taking me down to my question. Um, I'm an 18th, I'm a historian of the 18th century. Um, and so my question for you is how do we, how can we look at the imperial crises of the 18th century as really informing how the governorships 
of, co of colonial powers, how the emergence of vice regalities, how that's shaped, because I'm thinking about kind of the messiness of the governors of the American colonies. You've got people like uh, John Murray who gets bumped around to like three different colonies and he manages to screw them all up. Um, how does that perception of having a ceremonial role rather that gives you a direct pipeline to an authority based on right rather than some kind of democratic principle contrast with one where it's an active daily administrative role that has the potential to kind of throw local politics into chaos. Um, I'm also thinking, I study Barbados as well, and thinking about the fact that Barbados goes over a century without a slave rebellion, I argue partly because they do not have absentee planters the way places like Jamaica and others do. Mm -hmm. And that that perception, even if you're not being heard, even if your, your, your demands, your needs are still being ignored, you're still being horribly treated, the perception of that, that authority um so so it's kind of a two-part question but i'm really i'm interested in the origins of of this system thank, thank you so much erin and and um they're uh, very very good uh, point and actually yes i've just been for my constitutional history of the uk book just been doing the hanoverians and so on so this is um hopefully of interest of interest uh, to you and 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 i've been Looking at it, and in some ways, um, as you know, with something like the British system uh, or the English system at times as well, is that it is um, it's very difficult to pinpoint what it is. Uh, so it means that the you know so the the um, the crown of George the first say, and his perception of it is a very uh, different one from George the third. Or Charles the First, or Elizabeth the Second, and so there there is um, a, a lot of uh, contingency here. And if we then expand that to the, um, if I understand stood your question correctly, to the um, imperial context, especially the colonial uh, one, um, these are you know these are you know massive executive powers because they um, they fuse together as you say, administrative, ceremonial, and executive power, uh, and, and, and military power as well. And um, even in the 20th century, you see certain uh, cases where, um, say like we talked about Sri Lanka, where the Oliver Gunathelika saw the ceremony, what, what was usually described as the ceremonial title of the queen, which governors generals also had, and these governors that you mentioned did also have commander in chief was an actual military title which entitled uh people like Paul Schoon in Grenada in the 80s and Gunathelika in Sri Lanka in the um in 1958 when there were major riots to use military power and direct uh not just civilian officers but military officers into doing their bidding and that absolutely as you know probably better than me, comes from um, these historical origins of where the governor uh, represented not just the crown, but the manifestation of government, including the monopoly of violence. Great. OK, thank you. Um, well, I think if there aren't any further questions, um, we'll probably wrap up there we've worked harsh and uh, pretty hard actually <laughs> but uh, i want to thank, get everyone to join me in thanking him for such a, a wide-ranging geographical and thematic uh, paper so thank you thank you very much Harshan.